Hello, my name's Jorb, and I love gear. Have you ever heard a sound like this? Or a synth sound like this? Or maybe a sound like this. These are all exciting synth sounds, but their sound is more than just their synthesis. They're really brought to life by effects. In this context, effects are sound design tools that alter or add to a sound that passes through it. Distortion, modulation, delays, reverbs, all sorts of flavors. And going all the way back to the beginning, the history of synthesizers is intrinsically linked with the history of effects design. Synthesizers have had built-in effects at least as far back as the ensembles on string machines and the spring reverb built into the ARP 2600. Not to mention guitar pedals, whose entire circuit design is based on innovations from synthesis and synthesizer design. Synths and effects are meant to be together. They've always been together. It's evident in how many modern synthesizers include built-in effects. It's nearly expected. But let's say your hardware synth doesn't have any built-in effects, or it has a few, but you want to experiment with something beyond that. Well, you have a few options. There is an endless and exciting and innovative selection of software plugins. There is the mighty, yet often underappreciated, rack effects of the 80s, or my favorite, and the topic of today's video and the rest of the videos in this series, the humble guitar pedal. Before synthesizers, my true love was guitar pedals. I had a huge pedal board, probably too big, the whole time I played uh, in a band in college, and even earlier in high school, that's when I started to love gear was building a fuzz pedal and realizing that that sound I had been hearing was things like this, things like the small stone or a delay pedal. But you guessed it, guitar pedals are primarily designed to be used with guitars. <laughs> and they do just manipulate audio, so we can run whatever the fuck we want through them. And for me and many others, that is going to be a synthesizer. But there are some things you should know before buying and using guitar pedals with synthesizers. And that's where I, this video, and this series comes in. This is going to be the first in a series of videos that I've been talking about for a long time, and I really want to make sure I get right. And this first one is everything you need to know to get started, and probably a little bit deeper. This is the Synthesis Guide to Guitar Pedals, part one. In the first video, we're going to talk about everything you need to know to get your gear working together well. We're going to talk about powering your pedals, stereo signal paths, and what to know about levels. This video will be separated into chapters. You can just watch the parts you need. You can just watch the part you want to learn about. Uh, either from the bottom of the YouTube player or a little lower. They're listed out in the description. Uh, while you're checking those out, you should click subscribe because <laughs> it helps me out a lot. Uh, and you won't miss the rest of the videos in the series or any other gear coverage. No more pitches. Let's get to the real information. Now, a lot of these first topics might seem kind of boring, but they're all really important to making sure things work together well without any issues. And it's information that I will reference back through the rest of the series in episodes specifically about delay or chorus or reverb or distortion. I'm just getting these set up things out there first so I can always call back to it. When I reference something that has to do with power or stereo or watching my levels, all that will come back to this episode. Cool? Cool. As I go through the three sections of power, stereo, signal flow, and levels, and I will interrupt each of those sections with a sort jam break, just like this one. First, we have powering your pedals. Pedal power is mostly a standard uh, in the modern era at this point in time, but there are some things to understand to make sure things are working well and you're not going to break any pedals. But many pedals expect 9-volt DC power, and some can run on 9-volt batteries, which goes pretty far back in their history. But many don't ship with their own power supply. You're expected to either use batteries or they'll come with a single battery. 
Because batteries will, of course, die over time, many people opt for a power supply, which can look like this. This is a one spot. It's a single wall wart going to one barrel connector. You can use it to power one pedal, or they make cables that daisy chain, that connect multiple outlets to this one wall wart. And that can work well for a few pedals, but digital pedals will dump a lot of their ground uh, when they're daisy chained like that, and they all share the same amount of current coming from that power source. So it might not be the best option. If you have issues with that or you need to get a little bigger, you can get something like <laughs> you can get something like this. This is my trusty Voodoo Labs Pedal Power 2 Plus. It has one IEC connector to go into the wall and then eight isolated outputs for eight or if you daisy chain one of those, a few more uh, pedals. And it even has a pass through uh, for an outlet if another pedal has a specific, very different power supply. So back to our sort of standard, the modern connection standard is a barrel plug or cables that look like this 2.1 millimeters negative center sometimes called boss style or anymore people say pedal power jacks and <clears throat> when I say negative center what that means and it's very important these barrel connectors have two places to pass a signal the outside which is the barrel and on the inside which would connect to uh, a pin on the receiving end of a pedal power in this case and in the pseudo standard <laughs> of pedal power is a voltage and a ground and the standard is a negative center and positive around the barrel or the shield okay so that's our pseudo standard most pedals will take 9 volt DC power passed over a negative center 2.1 millimeter barrel and these are the symbols that will tell us all of that that is a straight-on look at one of these barrel connectors and that dot in the center is the center and so if negative symbol is going to that you have negative center sometimes there's a positive symbol going to that but it's the pseudo standard because none of that is true 100 percent of the time some pedals run at higher voltages some pedals take a different style of connector my small stone for example takes what looks like a euro rack patch cable mono eighth inch cable passes power over that and none of that makes any mention of our current <laughs> which is different to our voltage and so if you use the water pipe analogy, if you haven't heard of it, totally fine. I'm just going to blast right through it. Voltage is the pressure of our water, electricity, and the current is how much flow we have, right? So when you need to match those up, what, what really matters, what's important, in most cases, your voltage should be exactly the same as what's printed on the pedal or described in the manual, but your current can be higher. Your pedal will take as much current as it needs, but the voltage is pushed to it from the power supply, if you want to think of it like that. So you want the right voltage and enough current. Cool. So some pedals only take a small amount of current measured in milliamps. A lot of analog drive pedals are way, way low, but some demand a lot more. My Strymon El Capistan needs a minimum of 250 milliamps. So always double check and make sure your pedal runs on the power you think it does. Often it'll be printed right on the pedal because companies recognize that these things are fucking confusing and connector type, you should be able to know if it fits in or not, but voltage, polarity, current you really should be double checking that's a ton of shit. i know that how do we manage it all what does it really look like for us trying to plug in our synthesizers well because companies know this they put out products that are ready to work with this inconsistent world of pedal power pedal power supplies are made with consideration to the market that they're going to power of course they are why wouldn't they be uh for example True Tone, who makes the one spot, they sell products to convert that standard 2.1 millimeter negative center barrel jack to tons of other things. One that looks just like this. You plug in a barrel connector in one end and the other end is that eighth inch jack that some pedals want power over. There are little dongle connectors that just reverse the polarity. There are ones that just change the size of the barrel connector for pedals that want a different size. They even have adapters that change a barrel connector to 9 volt battery snaps that you put to the opposite end of the battery snap in the pedal for ones that were designed without any external power jack. And things like Voodoo Labs Pedal Power 2 Plus, which I have used proudly for years, it has different outputs with different amounts of current, and it has these uh, dip switches on the back that allow you to change the behavior of individual outputs beyond that. So some can be changed from 9 to 12 volts if your pedal demands that. Some can be trimmed to drop the voltage and simulate the sag of a dying battery if you like the way that behaves with your drive pedal. It even has this outlet pass-through. So if you have a pedal that needs some specific sort of power that cannot be provided by uh, your supply, you can just plug in that pedal's own adapter. So 
Let's summarize, right? What does all of this mean for the real world of sitting down to power your pedals? Always double check you're providing a pedal with the right power. And the right power is the right voltage over the right connector with the right polarity with enough current. And they make power supplies specifically for high current pedals, and they make power supplies specifically for uh, a number of different voltages. Options are out there for anything you want to do. But for just two or three pedals, especially ones with relatively low current draw, you can get away with just a daisy chained one spot. Or if they came with their own power supplies, just plug them into a power strip and use those. And only if you have an issue with noise or you need more flexible power, you're buying things that don't include their own supplies, or you just want to keep things neater and tidier, that's when you should get a proper power supply. But in many cases, if you're just plugging in one, two, three things at a time, start with a daisy chain power supply. You'll save a bunch of money, and it will probably be good enough for you. Whew, damn, I talked for a long time. How about a jam break? Next chunk of information, let's talk about stereo. What does it mean when a synthesizer has stereo outputs? What does it mean when a pedal has stereo outputs? The only thing that's consistent about it is there's a difference in the left and right channel. Some synthesizers will pass totally different sounds on one output or the other. Some synthesizers are only stereo once they are introduced to, in effect, the Juno 106, for example, is a totally mono signal path until you get to the chorus, and the chorus makes it stereo. But if the chorus is off, that is the same exact signal passed to the left and right. You would get the same information if you just plugged in the left channel or the right channel until you turn on the chorus, and then it's different on each side. And the same thing with pedals. A chorus pedal or a flange, flanger or a delay or a reverb, their stereo means something different. And if you really care about the way chorus pedals work in stereo, you should subscribe <laughs> so you catch the modulation episode. That was stupid, I'm cutting that one. But because they're all so different, it's important to understand what they're doing because some synths have um, a stereo spread where different voices will get panned a different amount left or right. And if that's on and you don't realize it and you're trying to just plug into the left output, it'll sound like some of your voices are way quieter. Well, they're panned 60% to the right and you only have the left output plugged in, so you're not hearing them at a full volume. Uh, things like the Nord Lead 2, it'll double up the voices and send one left and one right with a slight detune between them. And understanding that helps with guitar pedals because a lot of them are in mono, drive pedals, delay pedals, chorus pedals even. Often the guitar pedal iteration of that effect is going to be in mono because it's made for guitar. So it's important to know what your specific hardware is actually doing between its left and right outputs. So here's a setup example. Your synth has a stereo output because it has a chorus and you want to run it through a mono pedal, a delay pedal, for example. What are your options? You could turn off the chorus and run through the pedal, but if we still want that chorus, we can add a pedal afterward, even a stereo one. Or, if you're using a mixer, you can have the chorus on on your synthesizer, run both channels into the mixer, and then have an aux send or a mono send that goes to the delay pedal, and then mix that back in however you would. Now, some pedals are mono in and stereo out, so you could do the same setup and then have the stereo of that delay pedal go to two channels of your mixer. I could go on and on <laughs> with examples like that forever and examples of stereo setups, but some pedals are mono in and stereo out. They might introduce an effect that behaves in stereo like a chorus, a flanger, or a reverb. Some pedals are stereo in and stereo out, and they might process each side differently, like a delay that passes back or a reverb that spits out a stereo image. Uh, but other pedals, like the El Capistan, sum the stereo to a mono signal it gets passed to the effect. So whatever comes into left and right in comes out of the left and right out, and as you turn up the mix, you're bringing in more of the stereo input summed to mono and then passed to the delay. 
and the delay might ping pong back and forth between left and right, or the reverb might be different on each channel, but the signal that's getting passed to the effect is a summed version of your stereo signals. So it's all different and it's all specific, and I could go on and on with examples, but I don't think that's super helpful in a video like this. So I'll summarize. Mono is not worse. In fact, sometimes it's easier to mix with a mono signal, especially considering if you want to pan things around. Uh, understand your synth stereo behavior, understand your pedal stereo behavior, and really think about your additional options with things like a mixer, and don't be afraid to try unconventional signal paths. Just because you have a stereo out doesn't mean you can't use two mono pedals or a mono pedal doing something you wouldn't expect it to do. So in the vein of that, enjoy this jam break using a very unconventional signal path. <laughs> All righty, we're doing good. Our last topic is levels, the volume, the amplitude of your audio signal. There are several different scales to measure this. DBV, DBU, straight up voltage, they're all a little different. They're all kind of related. They're used interchangeably by some people. They're printed next to each other on certain products. It's super convoluted, so I'm not going to use them. I'm going to use smooth brain, like me, terms like louder and hotter. And you're going to learn probably more than if we were trying to convert DBV to DBU. Okay? So generally, a synthesizer is going to be a lot hotter than a guitar signal. Right? Makes sense. It's a passive electronics versus active electronics. You can think of it like that. Uh, that's reductive. But most guitar pedals are expecting their incoming signal to be from a guitar. Right? Le relatively low volume, generally a high impedance. And with a signal from a synthesizer, something much, much hotter, what happens when we plug it into a pedal that doesn't expect that? It's different per pedal, <laughs> but let's see what happens to a pedal that can't quite handle it. You can see it clipping, right? The signal's hot enough to make it past the headroom of this pedal, and it's distorting, and we wouldn't expect this pedal to distort, especially not like that, okay? Does that happen with every pedal? No, it does not. For example, the Strymon El Capistan, which I keep referencing, it's designed to accept a wide enough range of input levels that synths can pass through undistorted. And this is somewhat common with modern pedals because they expect people to be plugging them into synthesizers. Um, but the specific levels that your pedal can handle are normally printed in the manual. If it's something vintage or old and you're not sure, just try it. Be, ca <laughs> be careful, but try it. See what you can get it to do. Uh, well, how can we fix it? you can turn your synth down <laughs> so that the range of its output is within the headroom of a certain pedal. And what if the resulting output is now way lower than straight out of the synthesizer? Or some pedals might just reduce your volume with the effect engaged or not because of the way they work. Uh, hopefully, you have enough gain available in your mixer to compensate, or any other pedal later in that signal chain can push your level back up to what you were expecting. But what about the other direction? Can our signals get hotter with guitar pedals? Absolutely. Often, with gain pedals, drive, distortion, fuzz, they will increase the volume of whatever is coming into it, and the resulting signal will be hotter than the input. Many of these pedals have a volume control to compensate for that, and it's common to set up a pedal in such a way that when you have the right amount of gain, the right amount of distortion, uh, you balance the level so that it's unity or a little bit above uh, when you engage the effect. And again, if it gets so hot through your pedal chain that you need to turn down in your mixer, turn down in your mixer. So levels do matter, and we need to make sure we aren't overloading the front input of any pedals. It's not super likely that you'll damage something using the normal outputs of a synthesizer, but it is something you need to be aware of. And even more so, your rack is hotter. Your rack is higher than the line out of a normal hardware synthesizer. So if you're using your rack with pedals, you need to be very, very careful about your gain or bring it down to line level with, there's tons of pedals to interface, bring it down to line level before you run it through. Uh, so, Levels matter, we need to make sure we aren't overloading the input of any pedals, and we need to stay aware of changing output levels as affected by our pedal chain. Higher or lower than our original signal are both quite likely, so we want to stay in a good range for our ears first and foremost, but also our mixer and the rest of our equipment. There are, wouldn't you know it, products specifically designed to manage this mismatch of levels. Morley makes, I think it's just called the line level converter, 
and it's a passive little box, and it will convert from line level synthesizers to instrument level, like a guitar. Uh, and Radial makes a few boxes called reamp boxes, and what a reamp does brings your line level signals down to instrument level, so they're ready to interface with pedals. That is not exactly what a DI does. A DI expects a instrument level signal, like a guitar or an electric piano, and it brings that to a mic level, sometimes makes it balanced as well. The main reason for that is low cable runs or you run it into a uh, mixer with a preamp like you would a microphone. Uh, but that's totally off to the side. In my experience, I'm not particular enough to keep things super clean or super precise or consistent across sessions. It, if I did, I would get a reamp box or one of those line level converters, but I don't need them. I, I turn down when I hear an issue. I turn down when it's too loud. Alrighty, there we go. I sure do talk a lot. That is the first look at everything you need to know to get your sense working well with guitar pedals. I hope this was helpful. Future episodes are coming on individual effects types, which will be much more fun. Don't forget to subscribe so you can watch the rest of the series. I'll cover distortion, modulation, delays, reverbs, maybe more. My name's Jorb. I love gear. That includes guitar pedals. Hope to see you in the next one. Cheers. So long. <laughs>